Hello, Stephanomics here, the podcast that brings you the global economy. And this week we are circling the globe to give you an insight into three key pieces of the grand economic jigsaw we discuss week after week. People, property and policy. Now, people, we know, have been a highly sought after commodity in the post-COVID world, with employers everywhere struggling to fill empty positions. But millions of people who did have jobs before the pandemic still somehow missing. What's interesting, though, is it's not only the low-skilled, potentially unrewarding jobs that are going unfilled. Fashion houses in Italy are also struggling to find people who want to learn how to hand-stitch a belt buckle or fashion an elegant pair of shoes. We go to the rolling hills of Tuscany to talk to the head of the iconic fashion brand Fendi about that shortage in a little while. We also have the stunning news from Hong Kong, that the world's priciest housing market is finally getting very slightly more affordable. Our Chief Asia Economy correspondent, Ender Curran, explores why prices are falling there and whether $3 million can now buy a harbour view in just a few minutes. But first, we're going to Washington, D.C. for arguably the most important single policy decision in the entire global economy. And it's happening again this week as the U.S. central bank meets to set interest rates. It's particularly interesting this time around because we're expecting the first normal-sized interest rate rise, half a percentage point, since the Fed began raising the cost of money in America aggressively some months ago. The Fed's senior policymakers were also meeting the day after a surprisingly weak figure for US consumer price inflation, holding out the tantalising possibility that the US might just be turning the corner in its fight against inflation. Well, Bloomberg Chief US Economist Anna Wong is grabbing a few minutes on a very busy day to talk to us. Anna, thank you very much. Um, First, I guess you should just remind us what's happened so far. How much has the Fed tightened monetary policy, raised interest rates, and where has it left the official interest rate right now? So this year, we saw one of the most rapid Fed tightening cycle. It's the most rapid pace since the 1980s. From 0% of the Fed funds rate earlier this year, the Fed has hiked to currently uh, 4% on the upper end. And they're expecting to hike 50 basis point later today to uh, so that the Fed funds rate will will reach 4.5% after today. And yes, we should explain. I'm talking to you because you'll be so busy immediately after the decision. We're we're talking it just before. Um, But there is, I think it would be safe to say, um, the world would be pretty surprised if we didn't see that half a point interest rate rise, even though there'll be other details that we'll get later from the from the press conference. That, that, That seems to be a done deal. Is that fair? That would be a fair characterization. <laughs> and uh, again, for people who aren't sort of looking at every twist and turn in the markets, just explain what interest rate they're actually setting. Because I know some people might think they're setting the interest rate that we might be able to get immediately in a savings account or that we'd borrow at if we got a mortgage. What is the rate that they're setting and why is it significant? Right. So the Federal Reserve set a, f- a rate called the Federal F- uh, funds rate. And that's the rate that uh, that the borrow rate that the Fed lends to other banks. Uh, it will take some time for other banks to channel that kind of higher or lower interest rates to, you know, other, you know, other entities that require funds. Ultimately, what affects the economy the most is um, the longer term rates. So think about um, when you go buy a car, you are you, you might need uh, auto loans. And those auto loans are tied to funds Five, tends to be most affected by five-year Treasury yield. And then mortgages, uh, which affects a lot of people, are most affected by 10-year Treasury yields. So when the Fed sets a very short-term rate, it's trying to affect the rates down the, the yield curve. Ideally, when the Fed wants to lower inflation, they want to raise the short term rates and then and and as a result the two year rates will rise and as a result five year rates will rise but sometimes things just don't go their way i mean for example 
if um, you know if if suddenly there's a, a global financial turmoil, let's say in China, then suddenly a lot of capital will flow out of China and into the United States seeking safe haven protection, and that could loosen financial conditions. So 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 when the Fed sets monetary policy, trying to tighten monetary policy, it, it actually depends a lot more other than the immediate uh, instrument that they can control. Yeah, so it's sort of setting the floor for rates and hoping that that has a kind of ripple effect for the rest of the market. But as you say, loads of other things can get in the way, whether people are feeling confident, whether banks are desperate to lend or desperate not to lend. Um, there's lots of things that can affect it. So it's certainly the case that the rate you hear about when you hear about the federal funds rate or in other countries, the base rate um, is not necessarily the rate that you're going to be offered if you try and borrow money. Now, um, I mentioned that there was a pretty interesting inflation number that came out earlier this week uh, that surprised many people, was much lower than expected. Um, Does that change uh, the calculation that that Fed policymakers have been making at their meeting? Well, it it certainly, the surprise yesterday was really a big surprise. It's an unusually large surprise. Um, Just to uh, say how how big of a surprise it is, uh, most people on the Bloomberg um, uh, survey think that it would be the monthly change on the headline would be 0.3. So that's how much prices have gone up just in one month. Yes, in one month. And uh, we, we were expecting a softer 0.2. And there are some people who think it's 0.2, but nobody thought it would be 0.1. So we were just talking about the ripple effect of Fed's uh, monetary policy. Well, what what yesterday's report did was that it lowered uh, the 10-year Treasury yields by 20 bips immediately upon its release. Two-year Treasury yields also plunged by 20 basis points uh, upon the release of the of the, of the Report and what that suggests to you is that investors are revising down their outlook several, you know, months and years ahead of of where inflation could be. On a very basic level, if you think interest rates on average are going to be a bit lower over the next two years, then your the rate you can you will lend to someone for two years um, goes goes down a bit. But there was a there was an interesting kind of side drama around that decision because, as you say, it was a surprising result. And when you have a surprise, you have the potential maybe for people to make money who were betting on one side and then the market moves dramatically. And actually, there was some pretty suspicious goings on. So tell us more about that. Right. So uh, about a minute before the date, CPI data was released at 8.30, there was suddenly a significant amount of trading on, on, on Treasury yields. And um, in the direction of where where if you we do get a dullish CPI surprise, that, that would be where things would be trading. So so by by being a bit early before, you know, everybody gets the same data, you, uh, somebody is making a lot of money with that move. So it's very unusual. And statistically, it just doesn't happen. And and, and even in previous releases, you don't see that kind of, um, you know, um, trading activity. And also what makes it even more suspicious is at the same time, a data delivery platform that's very popular among uh, policymakers and Wall Street analysts. Haver Analytics also crashed at, um, at the same time, and if you put the two dots together, um, you know that trading activity and also the crash of Haver. It almost, you know, it's a theory, but it's not a verified theory. But a theory could be that somebody could be trying to delay the reaction of a, you know Wall Street analysts so that they can prolong on that you know early uh, inform if they do have early information of the CPI report then they could prolong that period where they are um, trading before everybody gets in on the information and as you said we could be talk- we could be talking about um, big money and uh, certainly anyone you used to work at the Fed, um, the Fed and some people in the U.S. Treasury would have, uh, in the U.S. administration, would have um, prior notice of that figure. And as you say, it was a, a, a surprise. Anyone who looked at it would say, "Hmm, that's going to cause a market move." So there's now going to be a real microscope on all the people who um, who did see that data before, because it would be pretty explosive if they'd leaked it. I don't envy them. I think they're in for a pretty uncomfortable. Um, week or so. Uh, But just to get back to the sort of main story, I mean, Anna, when you sit around, I don't know if you're going to be able to get to see any of your family over the holiday period, but when they say, Anna, you're the US economist, are we nearing the end of this battle against inflation? What do you say? (laughs) And 
and, and they they will hate me for it, but I'll say it's really unclear. <laughs> <laughs> Pass the so, potatoes. Um, <laughs> um, so so I, uh, you know, economists did have a poor track record with with um, with predicting the rise of inflation in the last two years. But I think what we did learn is that. Um, there are ways that inflation could continue to surprise. And number one is that if there are uh, unforeseen external supply shocks. So suppose that, you know, China reopens successfully in six months time and commodity prices spike again, and that <clears throat> um, Russia d- decide to cut um, supply of, of oil production so that so that they could um, punish those who, 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 who joined in on the G7 price caps. Then what we see is that a resurgence of uh, inflation m- mid next year and then inflation expectations would could rise significantly and then the fed will have to you know uh revamp their their uh, whole uh, rates rise um campaign even after pausing around um you know the second quarter of of next year as everybody currently expects so so i think they're looking ahead there's just so much uncertainty and i think the most useful way to look at the world right now is scenario planning and just think about how, you know, if what shocks could lead to a surprising uh, resurgence in inflation or what shocks could lead to more deflationary pressure. And if you think about how the economy is being affected by these higher interest rates, you know, we talk about a recession being inevitable in the US and other places because of this need to squeeze demand and bring inflation down. Um, are we are we seeing that happen? And are you any clearer on whether we will have a recession in the U.S.? You know, there Stephanie, there has been a little bit of a disconnect. Everybody became more gloomy about the the uh, the U.S. economy. The recession talks has uh, increased significantly over the past two weeks. But on the other hand, real data is, is surprising on the on how resilient U.S. consumers are. You know, we have seen uh, several data points that suggest. Uh, people are still spending. So, and what's the reason for that? And and I think the reason is that there's still a lot of money slushing around the economy. And even though um, the the pandemic stimulus has long ended, the fact is a lot of those money are, is still in the bank account of um, you know not only households but also state and local government. Um, so go, looking forward to next year, even though our recession probability models are flashing really red right now and suggesting to us that a recession could happen around August or September of next year, um, there is a chance that the recession might not happen then th- th- and then until much later just because um, – you know, people do have savings. And so currently the the recession we are expecting would be a shallow one where consumption would still be positive, where, um, you know, things are still pretty good from, from the household side. Unemployment rates rise to about 5%. But, you know, all in all, it's, it's not the 2008 kind of recession. And I guess that would be a decent Christmas present for people if you said if we were going to Get rid of inflation without having uh, a deep a deep recession and conceivably no recession at all, although it doesn't sound like you're betting on that. That's right. Anna Wong, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Now, I said the Fed decision had global implications. Hong Kong is 13,000 kilometres away But it does feel the full force of US interest rate increases because its currency is directly linked to the US dollar. So when the Fed hikes, Hong Kong has to hike too. Though with more hands-on control from Beijing and the lingering impact of China's COVID-0 policies, higher interest rates are just one of the factors making Hong Kong real estate ever so slightly more affordable. Here's Ender Curran. Hey, Anda. Mm-hmm. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Of course you can, yes. Where are we? We are in the middle of Wan Chai. It's actually Wan Chai Road, and we're waiting to meet our Miss Cheng, Lily Cheng, who is a real estate agent. And we're hoping that Miss Cheng will be able to give us a tour of a property and to explain to us 
what she does. And it's a sunny Friday morning. My producer Yang Yang and I are standing in front of a fancy apartment building at the heart of Hong Kong Island. The building is converted from an old food market that dates back to the 1930s. These days, instead of fresh food vendors, the Art Deco architecture is the home to a boutique cafe, a furniture shop and a 43-floor residential block. It's a view that grasps almost everything quintessential of Hong Kong. From the apartment's 33rd floor balcony, you can see the mountains, the sea, the forest of skyscrapers, and of course, the famous horse track in nearby Happy Valley. You see the racing horse there? You can see. That's the racetrack there. Yeah, this is all the racetrack, you see. What a view. Yeah, this one we just sold 25 million. Yeah. 25 million Hong Kong dollars. Yes, 25 million Hong Kong dollars. That's more than 3 million US dollars for 900 square feet. So 25 million to save your horse racing <laughs> ticket. What a steal. <laughs> it's quite a nice deal. Uh, right. You have the double benefit. <laughs> Jokes aside, it might actually be a steal. Cheng told us that in the good years, she could easily sell this apartment for 2 million Hong Kong dollars more in much less time. One month, maybe one month, yeah, if the good season, a uh, good time, yeah, no. Hong Kong has long been known as one of the world's least affordable housing markets. That may be changing. The city now has more empty office space than ever before, and house prices are in decline. So what dragged the markets down? Cheng says China's COVID-0 policy had played a big role. So um, we have, before we have a lot of the is a mainland China people, that they come easily come to Hong Kong, and they will make the investment in Hong Kong, or they work in Hong Kong. But now, this time, the China and Hong Kong is shut down. Uh, it's for these two, three years, yeah. Hong Kong has only recently reopened its international border to the world after being shut since 2020. But travel between Hong Kong and mainland China has been dampened by Beijing's COVID policies, which are now in the course of being eased. There's another complication here, the US Federal Reserve. Because Hong Kong's currency is linked to the US dollar, the giant finance hub effectively imports US monetary policy. While the correlation isn't exact, it does mean that when Fed Chair Jerome Powell raises rates in Washington, the effects of those hikes ricochet through Hong Kong's banking system. Just like US house prices are cooling, in Hong Kong's residential market, economists are estimating a fall in house prices of up to 30% from their peak. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. I'm not to get a better idea of when the housing market might bounce back, if it bounces back, I went to see Nelson Wong, who's among those seeing the hit to real estate. I'm Nelson Wong, Executive Director uh, at Jones Lang LaSalle uh, for Hong Kong Research. From his office, Wong pointed across the harbour to Hong Kong's old airport. It's now in part being redeveloped for residential units that are struggling to sell. You, you can see the, the contact area from here. Um, you see the, the cruise terminal, which is right on the, the old Kaitak airport runway. And then uh, further back is the various residential developments that are on the runway. In Hong Kong, high real estate valuations have long been a pillar of the city's economic model, along with banking and trade. With the city's borders closed to the rest of the mainland, the wobble in housing is all the more acute. The, the unfortunate thing is that when Mr. Powell thinks of interest rates, um, he will not take into account what happens in Hong Kong. Of course, what's happening in Hong Kong is just one part of a broader global story, as real estate markets see prices go into decline. The worst inflation outbreak in decades has in turn sparked the most aggressive monetary policy tightening cycle in 40 years, which is driving up mortgages and driving down house prices and demand. 
because of its huge multiplier effect, real estate is at the centre of economic activity everywhere. But in Hong Kong, Nelson says, the authorities' hands are tied. We think that the, the slowdown would continue if we do not act uh, at this point. And there are, frankly, not a lot that the Hong Kong government can, can act on. Um, it cannot change the interest rate. It cannot change the political or, or geopolitical situations around us or, or in Europe, for, for that matter. While Nelson sees a further decline in prices, he also sees a bottom in Hong Kong's market. After my chat with Nelson, I went to see another veteran of Hong Kong's real estate market, Kimi Kimani, to hear her views on what lies ahead. This is Kimi Kimani from Savills Residential Services. I'm in charge of the residential team in Hong Kong. So we do leasing, we do sales, we do corporate tenancy, management, etc. We basically do everything except we don't find partners. Uh-huh. Kimi sees another decline in prices next year and says selling high-end apartments in Hong Kong isn't like it used to be. The valuations Kimi mentions here are Hong Kong dollars. Everyone's looking for a bargain. So if it's under, under value, everybody wants it. Let's say if your property is, is, you're asking for 50 million, bank valuation is 45 million, and the seller is selling it for 40 million. Yes, you will have buyers for sure, but otherwise not. People are just, it's a wait and see attitude at the moment for most of the buyers. And I can understand why, because of the economy of Hong Kong at the moment. How the real estate market plays out in Hong Kong remains unclear. A steep correction in Hong Kong could be a signal of deeper gloom for the global economy. Still, those like Kimi say Hong Kong has seen crisis before and has always rebounded. Yeah, but saying that, I want to again say that um, the Hong Kong people have a lot of resilience. It's in their DNA. It's in our blood. In Hong Kong, Enda Curran for Bloomberg News. Finally, we have the sad case of the missing artisan. And not so long ago, I seem to remember we were said to be moving to a maker economy with innovations in small scale manufacturing and online retailing, making it possible for more of us to learn the satisfaction of making a fine object from start to finish. It doesn't seem to have worked out that way. In fact, it's harder than ever to persuade young people to enter time honoured manual professions. Australia, for example, has a chronic blacksmith shortage. Dagger makers in Bali are in short supply. Even Italy's celebrated fashion and luxury companies are struggling to find the people they need in a country where the youth unemployment rate is nearly 25%. Here's our Italian economy reporter, Alessandra Milaccio. The first thing is a lot of admiration for Italy to have kept this uh, capacity, you know, this industrial, artisanal capacity uh, with this reactivity, this capacity to innovate. I mean, that's the first thing that uh, is really striking. If if we want to do more objects, uh, we need more people. And uh, if a generation goes, uh, where is the next generation? That's Fendi's new chief executive, Serge Brunswick. When he arrived in Rome almost five years ago, he knew there would be challenges. But the one he wasn't expecting? A lack of artisans. After all, Italy is known for its craftsmanship, from the violin makers, textile and master painters of the Renaissance, to modern fashion designers. Artisans in Italy are a natural pair. But soon after taking over Fendi, Brunswick realized that the skilled workers he so admired were clustered in small family firms, aging fast, and beginning to disappear. Is there a next generation? Are Italians making enough children? Are these children uh, all interested to uh, succeed their, their parents uh, in, in the company as they were before? Or should we uh, participate to uh, this elaboration of the next generation? So that's uh, how the question comes. A shortage of skilled artisans is a global problem. From Australia's blacksmiths to much of Europe's luxury sector, young people are looking for less manual career options. But what's startling about Italy is the magnitude of the phenomenon coupled with the youth unemployment rate near 24%. About one in every two job postings goes unfilled, according to luxury trade group Alta Gamma. 
That means there will be 94,000 missing workers in the fashion and jewelry sector in the next few years. Stefania Lazzaroni, director general of Alta Gamma, thinks the shortage is because of several factors. Lack of training, a mismatch between supply and demand, and a misunderstanding about pay. I think that there isn't much difference in salary between someone in the manufacturing sector and someone working in an office. Entry-level positions are the same, around 1,000 and 1,200 euros a month, and then it increases. These people are in demand because within the next two to four years, they will become rare, and so there's considerable potential for growth. Brunchvik decided to tackle the problem head-on. He knew money couldn't be the main reason Fendi had trouble finding artisans. It didn't make sense to him. Why would unemployed youth not want to work for a luxury company on a regular contract, making things of beauty? Especially if there were excellent long-term prospects. The problem seemed to be education. He knew in other European countries, trade schools are common and effective. Uh, as we know, the Germany is, is, is uh, training 900,000 young people on technical jobs per year uh, in the education system. France, about half of this, and uh, Italy, 15,000. So, it's another world. So, it means it doesn't exist. I mean, uh, education doesn't uh, provide uh, enough technicians to the industry in general. So, he set out to make Fendi a leader in training. Brunschwig had Fendi set up its own factories and try to find ways to train people, both in-house and through programs like the Adopt-a-School initiative run by Alta Gamma in collaboration with Italy's education ministry. It pairs trade schools with companies like Fendi, Jeweler Bulgari, or brands like Loro Piana and Ferragamo, just to name a few. To find the right fit for Fendi, Brunschwig traveled to one of Italy's historic shoemaking districts, an area nestled in the rolling hills of central Italy's Marche region. Here, he opened a sleek new factory, where steel machines hum in a designer pavilion near the medieval city of Fermo mixing modernity and tradition. We decided to travel to the factory and meet the artisans in training. Beatrice Giomarini is one of the high school trainees in the Fermo program. The idea of shoemaking was not an easy sell for the 18-year-old who first dreamed of becoming a hairdresser. People don't want to do this job because they see shoemaking as a job for losers. People say, oh, you make shoes, that's a bit useless. The idea of working in a factory has people imagining a closed space, dark, repetitive work, and sad workers, but it is not at all like that. Jo Marini's personal and family history, watching her mother struggle in the profession, made her wary of trying the job. My mother, when I told her I chose shoemaking, said she wasn't sure I was going to like it. She had done it and was a bit scared that I would be unhappy, but that didn't happen. She used to work at home for many, many hours and small details. She would do stitching for big name brands and it had to be perfect, and it was very stressful for her. She would work Sunday too and she was paid by piece. Here I see ladies working on stitching and they seem happy. They do a job they like, they look content to be here because every day they also work on the prototypes. They do different things. So now the problem was perception. Anna Maria Bernardini, the principal of Fermo's Ostilio Ricci Professional Trade School, says having brands like Fendi associated with their internships makes a huge difference. The presence of a prestigious brand helps a lot towards overcoming stereotypes some prejudices are cultural with families that follow trends. Currently, the trend is to choose high school and not trade school if you consider that only 12% of students in Italy choose a trade school. Carmela Calabro, professor of modeling and projects at the school, agrees. She remembers the excitement of students seeing the modern factory on their first day of the internship. We as professors who've done this type of work with students for years have seen students who were sent here as a last resort because they weren't doing very well anywhere else. And they come to life and really change. 
già etichettate addosso un ruolo. One of these wide-eyed trainees is 18-year-old Alessia Balla, who, like her friend Joe Marini, also wanted to go into hairdressing before seeing how the factory is run. While we spoke, she was watching an employee put the finishing touches on a pair of elegant Fendi boots, which retail for well over a thousand euros. Their gravity-defying heels are so complex that engineers had to study how to distribute the weight effectively before production could start. Bala says she can now imagine a future in shoemaking. Everything begins on paper from an idea, but it's wonderful to see it evolve and I like to see that come about. I hope to come here to work one day, to maybe learn more and specialize in sectors I like. That's what Brunswick is hoping and why he's opened a second factory in Tuscany's leather making district for handbags. He says maybe a TV show could help too, like the ones that have made cooking attractive. Frankly, to become a cook was not a dream when I was young, okay? Now it's a dream, okay? Well, they did something, something good uh, in communicating the, the interest of this, uh, of this job. You just have to do the same thing. I mean, if you are the one person able to transform an idea into a, a handbag or into a shoe, there's a lot of value. Infermo, I'm Alessandra Migliaccio for Bloomberg News. Well, that's it for Stephanomics. We'll be back next week with a sort of Christmas edition. In the meantime, please rate us wherever you get this podcast and check out the Bloomberg News website for more economic news and views on the global economy. You really also ought to follow at Economics on Twitter. This episode was produced by Yang Yang, Sama Sadi and Magnus Henriksen, with special thanks to Anna Wong, Alessandra Migliaccio, Flavio Rotondi and Enda Curran. Mike Sasso is the executive producer of Stephanomics.